بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Alhamdulillah, we have Tawfiq to continue our study of Islamic plan for life. In unit six, we said we see how Islam brings justice, order, and welfare to the society. Because unit six is about society. Unit five was about family. We talked about family, marriage, etc. So, we already talked about Islamic judiciary system, very briefly, of course. We talked about Islamic governance, because judiciary system secures justice, or you can say safeguards justice, because other things also help with justice. Governance helps with order. Now we want to see how Islam brings welfare and along with justice to the society. This is why we study uh, Islamic economy, very briefly. Alhamdulillah, there are books on Islamic economy, but this is just a part of one unit. What we mean by economy is a kind of social science, so it's social science, which studies production, distribution, consumption of goods and services. So we want to see how goods and services can and should be produced, consumed, shared, and in the long term, how we can make sure that the society is going away from poverty. As we know, Islam wants for us happiness or sa'ada, felicity of dunya and akhirah. The last unit of Islamic belief system was about felicity. Islam is not only saying your sa'ada is akhira in dunya, you know, whatever happens is not important, you have no responsibility, just try to finish it. Like, for example, you are in prison, you have to, you know, f finish your term in prison and then you are released. For us, actually, at dunya mazra'atul akhirah, whatever we are going to see in akhirah is made and is saved in dunya. And we have to make sure that the quality of our life in dunya is good and in akhirah is also good. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة not just حسنة in الدنيا or حسنة in آخرة إمام صادق عليه السلام said it's not he's not one of us who abandons دنيا for آخرة or abandons آخرة for دنيا Or we have that famous hadith. كن لدنياك كأنك تعيش أبدا وكن لآخرتك كأنك تموت غدا. One interpretation of this hadith is that when it comes to dunya, this is one interpretation. When it comes to dunya, live as if you are going to be here forever. 
So for example, when it comes to your health, treat your body as this body is going to serve you forever. Don't say, you know, it's just two, three years, you know, and I don't bother about my health. Or for example, you are repairing your home or building a house, whatever. Do it as good as you can, because in this way you improve. But if you say it's temporary, then you don't pay attention. But when it comes to akhirah, also, kun ka'annaka tamutu ghadan. Maybe you are dying tomorrow. So don't delay. If you have anything to fix before you die, do it quickly. Okay? So, Muslims are expected to be very much thinking and conscious of Akhirah, of their journey towards Allah, but at the same time, and actually for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they should be very efficient in organizing worldly affairs. So, we are expected to be pioneers in every science, every technology that helps humanity. Yeah? Not those types of technology that can be just a way of making money, etc. But anything which is ethical, anything that really helps humanity. And this is why you see a society which suffered from ignorance before Islam. There was no school, no university, no library, no literacy. Soon, these people, after embraced Islam, they become pioneers of the world. Even in sciences, which were not religious, secular sciences, in chemistry, in optometry, in many sciences. Although they were deprived of leadership of prophet and you know imams, still Islam had so much of impact that soon they become pion became pioneers and in medieval ages west me very much benefited from works of muslims even their knowledge of the greek of uh, you know greek philosophers and thinkers was through arabic translation later they were able to use the greek directly so Muslims realize that you can be a believer who is trying to secure his happiness in the hereafter, go to heaven, but at the same time, when it comes to building houses, roads, bridges, hospitals, schools, you have to be doing your best. Try to bring whatever talents Allah has given you to excel in these things. So, we don't accept the concept that we should abandon dunya or we should have a miserable life if we want to have good life in the hereafter. Our attitude towards economy or our uh, economical system if we want to understand it properly we should know its principles we should know its aims its methods and framework so we have to discuss all these things here we mention few points that give you inshallah some idea when it comes to the aims there are different schools in the world about economy. Some people are very much market-centered. For them, the main thing is to organize market. 
for some people is work and labor for some people is more farming and agriculture for some people is more exporting for some people is uh, you know um, private properties for some people is canceling private ownership like socialists and nationalizing for communists is absolutely abandoning ownership by individuals and everything belongs to this everyone so there, there are different views uh, but what about us what about islam we mentioned few aims of islamic economy one to have welfare to have adequate resources for life but not becoming attached not being owned you own but you should not be owned yeah the, there is a hadith which says laysa zuhd alla tamlika shay'an zuhd is not not to own bal Allah yamlikaka shay'un. Zuhd means not to be owned. You can have house and be zahid. You can have car and be zahid. But the condition is that your house should not own you. Your heart must be free. Your car must not own you. Yeah? So, we should have enough adequate kefaf of uh, you know worldly blessings but not to be attached to it what about becoming rich if i have more than what i need it's not a problem but you have to make sure that you earn it from acceptable ways from halal in general and spend also in the way which is reasonable so in islam we are not against rich people or you know against making money actually it's very good if you can generate wealth is okay but not to be attached to it not to use unethical immoral or illegal haram ways for making money and then when you earn money you have again to spend it response in a responsible way so these are our observations otherwise it's no problem if someone has lots of money there are several things that you have to consider when you are rich or you have some you know money or property etc number one you must know that this is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't be like qarun when they told him seek in what allah has given you the hereafter qarun said i had knowledge and because of that i have this money allah has not given me this money i was very clever i worked you know day and night i have this money you know some people you know think that their work or you know their uh, cleverness etc has made them rich but the first the uh, ultimate supplier and provider is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we should know that this belongs to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be grateful number two 
if you have money if you are rich if you have lots of capital islam says you must use it in a productive way not just you know put it in a box or you know in an account and not use it and not generate work and job and you know economical activities with this yeah so to accumulate money and just save it is not good it should be used in a productive way you know ayatul kanz those who just make treasures of silver and gold and don't use it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah warns them of punishment so it's very good if you can create job if you can create opportunities for other people to work and also you can add to your money or keep your money but not just waste it by you know just keep it without any activity <clears throat> number three every person should know that poor and needy people have some rights in their property <laughs> Allah praises Mu'mineen that there is a fixed amount in their property, in their money for the needy people. So I should know that Allah has given me, but not only for me, also to give to needy people. Number four, to pay your homes your zakat haqqullah this is also important number five also to spend on your family let them have comfortable not luxurious life but comfortable life it's very important that if you have money don't put your family under pressure when it comes to accommodation or food etc uh, to give them some we call you know tosa means you know com some comfort pardon yes number six not to do israf not to use in excess number seven not to have luxurious life because this then would lead to wastage and also this would make most likely make you forget that you are here for a short period of time and also it would encourage other people or create competition yeah if I can afford and make a luxurious life then my relatives my friends my neighbors also want to make the same thing not number eight not to be attached to dunya Number nine, not to let this lead to a kind of pride and arrogance and say, I am better than other people or say to people, I am better than you because I have, you know, this, uh, this is very bad. Also, people should know that at the same time that we respect everyone, unless there are exceptions, but normally speaking, we respect everyone. But we should not have additional respect for people just because they are rich. Hadith says, Man if you show humility in front of a rich person just because he's rich then two-thirds of your faith is damaged I can be humble before someone because he's my teacher or he has knowledge or he's an old person 
yeah the old person or is a person who serves the community but someone is exactly like another person age wise or any rights that they have over me anything is the same but just this person has a more expensive for example house or more expensive car i show more respect to you this is not acceptable the second aim is establishing justice and removing discrimination unfortunately in some economical models they say we have to produce wealth generate wealth but they are not they don't bother about distribution therefore you see the society the state becomes richer but poor people become more poor yeah so they say overall we made this much money every year we make this much for example you know uh, progress but how is it distributed if rich people become more rich and poor people become more poor this is not acceptable Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran inna Allah ya'muru bil adl wal ihsan justice has to be observed and kindness in every aspect including economy and islamic economy is not based on law it's only or on sharia only or on obligations only part great part of islamic economy is achieved through akhlaq and voluntary work of people if people are void of kindness and love and you know generosity economy cannot work you cannot buy police only and you know penalties and prison implement islamic economy islamic economy is using people's voluntary engagement and offering very much even if there is no police we cannot for example sell less than what we should you know for example i have to give 1 kilogram give 950 grams yeah or i have to work 8 hours i work you know 7 hours and half an hour i should watch myself there is no problem and actually this is unavoidable and can also sometimes be uh, useful if you have different um, talents different uh, capabilities different backgrounds some people you know are making more money some people less it's not a problem as long as there is no discrimination yeah because sometimes some people are deprived of their rights and then other become people become rich this is not good but if everyone has equal opportunity and some people then know how to make more money that's not an issue so we don't want to say all people should live at the same level every person should receive you know fixed amount of income this is not islamic we should allow for people to use their creativity someone who is working harder anyways they have more talents as long as other people also have access and law is not giving favoritism you know is not like that is okay of course we said that rich people what should they do education should be available for all good jobs some basic needs housing shelter medicine this should be available at least we should not have 
you know, any problem in providing people with the basic needs. So absolute poverty should not be there. But comparative or relative poverty might be there. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see the signs of his blessing that he has given to his servants over them. So if Allah has given me money, it's good to use it. If Allah has given me ability to have good dress, I should use it, not, uh, you know, say I shouldn't use it. Not luxurious, not too much, but there is no problem in people using in a responsible way uh, what they can afford to have. So when Imam Sadiq said, Allah loves to see this effect or the sign of his blessings on his servants, he was asked how? He said, for example, have tidy clothes, use perfume, make your home and outside your home clean before Maghreb turn on the light these are the things that some people may think you know we can live without these things but we should have some good standard of life and this is not bad Another thing is, in Islamic economy, it's very important that everyone works. Everyone is productive. Not that they become burden on the society or burden on their family or friends or neighbors. Sometimes, when Rasulullah was introduced to a young person and you know people were praising him but when Rasulullah was aware that he has no job he was saying Sakata min aini. means he lost his position in my eyes how can a young person just sit at home and do nothing you have to work and this is uh, ibadah, great portion of ibadah is making halal income. Even in some lectures I have explained that even if someone says to you, I give you whatever you need, you need, for example, every month 2,000 pounds, I give you 2,000 pounds, just sit at home. Say no, you are my enemy or you're my friend. If you are my enemy, okay, but as a friend, how you want me to sit at home and do nothing? I have to work, even if I can make the same money that people are giving me as free or benefit, I should work. <clears throat> work is very important. Maybe your father can give you, but say thank you very much. Alhamdulillah, I am healthy, I can work. And if I need, I take from you. Even if he offers, say, no, let me work. So to work, to be productive, one of the reasons why reba usually is prohibited one reason is this because people who do usually may not do anything just they have money and they don't work and they don't take risk and just they want to make money islam says you have to be productive use this money by creating job by you know but something that may have also risk Another aim of Islamic economy is that we try to be economically independent as a family, as a community, as a nation, as a state. 
everyone tr should try to become independent so that they are not dependent on others Muslim nation, Muslim countries also should try to help each other have cooperation, collaboration so that if a Muslim country has need other Muslim countries support them it's a shame for us if Muslims need non-Muslims to help them yeah, it's a shame it's not bad for them to help but it's bad for us that we have the best of resources in the world and still some Muslim countries are not able to meet their needs just even not all Muslim countries just three four Muslim countries they have so much <laughs> that they can feed all poor, poor people of the world Muslims and non-Muslims so economical independence is very important another aim is development farming industry trades and then having a fair taxation system so the government should receive a fair amount of taxation from people to look after the common needs of the society government should not by itself become a very rich you know entity which is you know demanding from people always money government is at the service of people Beitul Mal is for people it's a servant of the people it has to be fair taxation and only for the good of the people finally as we said we should try to combat poverty through some economical plans for creating job opportunities but also in the end of the day there are people that they cannot work sometimes there are people who are very old sometimes there are people who are ill yeah we should have welfare system so that even people who are not able to work they can work there's a beautiful story here in the book which is uh, famous uh, the, uh, the story is about Imam Musa Sadr in the city of Sur Thair in Lebanon he saw that there are many beggars on the street and it was very you know sad thing that there are so many beggars in on the streets so he asked these beggars to be collected and they made a survey they found these beggars are four groups some of them were very rich so he said you cannot you know beg because you have enough some were poor but they had family members who were rich and could look after them so they said to the family you should look after these people some people were poor but they could work he gave them jobs the fourth group of people who were very you know weak and they could not make any job so for them he allocated monthly payments and then said to the people no one should give any money to the beggars and they put charity boxes so that we have a system here in this city no needy person remains without help and no one can misuse this so there always seem to be the case uh, till inshallah Imam Zaman comes that 
he would eradicate all kind of poverty but in our time it always happens that some people not because they are lazy not because you know they don't want to work some people cannot they have some problems we need to support them but we have to have a efficient system that would meet all their needs and would not let any person to take advantage okay this is about the last part of unit six inshallah uh, in the next session we start the last unit which is about islamic culture and civilization we will discuss in this unit different things including islamic calendar and some important occasions in the calendar these things are inshallah useful for you uh, for yourself but also many of you might be teachers or you know your parents or anyway uh, maybe you know these things it's a reminder but also it's good way of having uh, organized information for you to teach to others so when we talk about islamic calendar for example uh, maybe it's not very new for you but to know how to present uh, inshallah would be useful so inshallah maybe in two more sessions we can finish inshallah the book alhamdulillah rabbil alamin